fun. My name is Brian Owen. I'm uh, one of the Adult Connections pastor here, and so I work with um, college students, young adults, and uh, young married couples. And what an exciting night we had Tuesday, and it's my joy and honor to get to work with uh, Dakota. He's going to have a table in the back, uh, so if you're interested in getting connected and figuring out how you can do that with us, we'd love to uh, connect with you um, back there. And so, uh, so welcome, thank you, and uh, Bray's uh, graciously allowed me to uh, fill in this morning, and um, we're finishing up uh, a series that we're calling Stuck, and the whole reason that we're calling it Stuck, and we're saying five things that are, are missing from your life, um, is really, uh, we would say these five things are pretty crucial um, for if you're a believer, and also if you're uh, not a believer, uh, we would say these things are, are pretty crucial. And really, in essence, the, the study that we've been looking at in the last couple of weeks, we've been um, the, really the passages, or these passages that we would see in the New Testament called the one another passages. So this, this word, one another, in the Greek, it's just one word. So it's not two separate words, but all throughout the New Testament, we see the statement over and over and over again that says one another, one another, one another. Uh, there's actually a uh, hundred times. So a hundred times this statement is used in 94 verses in the New Testament. A hundred times. One third, so one third of these verses are just dealing with church unity. One third of them. And so over the, the, the weeks, we've looked at uh, serving one another, teaching one another, encouraging one another, uh, forgiving one another. Extremely difficult things. Hard things for us to do as God's people and just people in general. But one third of them, we see one third is dealing with the unity of the church, of the body of believers. A couple of, you don't have to, to go there. I'll just read these, a couple of these statements that we see. Um, be at peace with one another. Don't grumble among one another. Be of the same mind with one another. Accept one another. Wait for one another before beginning the Eucharist. I've never had to use this one. Don't bite, devour, and consume one another. Uh, if I get there, um, that'll be a day. Don't uh, boastfully challenge or envy one another. Gently, patiently tolerate one another. Be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving one another. Bear with and forgive one another. Seek the good for one another. Don't complain against one another. Confess sins to one another. All throughout the New Testament, Paul is pushing on us, pushing on us to be unified to love and care for one another. And so this morning, I, I want to talk about one of the things I would think is, is one of the most difficult, uh, and it's accept one another. We should accept one another. So if you have your Bible, go to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Before we get there, I want to read this quote by a guy named Rick Warren, a pastor. And uh, this is what he said, because we're thinking about working within the context of the church, um, obviously out, even outside the church, but as we're thinking about through the lens of um, the local church. This is what Rick Warren has to say about this idea of accepting one another. I, I think this is great. He says, the local church is the classroom for learning how to get along in God's family. It is a lab for practicing unselfish, sympathetic love. As a participating member, you learn to care about others and share the experiences of others. I love this part that he says right here. He says, only in regular contact with ordinary imperfect believers can we learn real fellowship and experience the New Testament truth of being connected and dependent on each other. I love that. He just basically says the local church is a lab, is a lab for helping us understand how to love and care for one another. That, that each day, isn't this beautiful? Then not God, then he, isn't it a wonderful thing that he would give us the opportunity to be around each other as difficult and rebellious as we are and then says, hey, love and accept one another. What a gift. And so this concept, this concept is hard, but it's biblical. So let's look at Romans chapter 15. Let's start in verse one. So this is Paul writing to the church at Rome. If you're, if you're not familiar with a lot of the New Testament, um, Paul was a guy who was rebellious. He hated God's people. Um, it, 
Paul, uh, really his story picks up. His name was Saul. When we meet him uh, in Acts chapter four, chapter five, and when we meet him, he is uh, overseeing the death of one of an early Christian leader in the Christian church. And then God saves him. There's this remarkable confrontation with Paul on the road to Damascus. And the beautiful thing about God is he takes this dude who is rebellious and hates the message of the gospel and and saves him. And he writes the majority of the New Testament. And so that's who's writing. This guy named Paul. It's persecutor of the church. So Romans chapter 15, verse one. Let me pray and then we're gonna dive in. God, thank you for your word. God, may we... um, stay within the boundaries of it. God, thank you that you have something to say to us this morning, that you are not silent, that you have not left us on our own, but you're communicating truths to us through your word. So God, give us the courage to accept these words as they challenge our sin nature, as they rebel against the way that we would seek to live. We pray all this in Christ's name, amen. Romans chapter 15, starting in verse one, this is what he says. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves, not to please ourselves. Now, a couple of thoughts here. So, um, so I read that, and this is where some of you went to automatically. You just went to, I'm the strong. I'm the gift. Right, so, so I read that, and I was so impressed for saying this is not necessarily what the morning's about, but he says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, and you automatically went to, that's me. You're welcome. Come in close, right? Come in close. Now, I think there is, there is truth, obviously, in the fact um, that the church is made up of both weak and, weak and strong Christians. That's the truth. And, and we can be okay with that. Like, that's okay. Now, now I, would say, um, I would say anybody that I've met that has a high view of self, Typically, the reason they have a high view of self, this goes hand in hand with accepting one another's. Usually, the reason that they have a high view of self is because there's a lack of closeness and community in their life. It's their kind of isolation bubble. And so Paul says, the, the strong should help the weak. Here's the first thought. I have, I have uh, four points. A good Baptist has three, but I want to bless you this morning. Here's some more. <laughs> We're called to, what are we called to? We're called to help one another in our spiritual growth. We're called to help one another um, in our spiritual growth. So Paul says there's weak and then there's strong. How do we identify what a weak believer is? I think that's important. I think we fall in both of these categories uh, at various times in our life, depending on what we're talking about. But here are three things that we can help identify what does it mean to be a weak um, believer. Three things. First thing, um, someone who's easily offended. So the reason I say that is because in Romans chapter 14, uh, Paul gives this discussion on uh, you have some brothers and sisters who are weak, and so um, you you shouldn't eat this in front of them, right? And and, and Paul is basically saying, um, he's 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 not necessarily saying, encouraging them and going, hey, don't eat these things, don't do these things. He's really saying, hey, you got a weak brother and sister, and so you should be careful about how you live around them. I mean, he's identifying uh, a weakness as those who are easily offended. We, we have a, a tendency in the Christian church. Uh, I think it is healthy to set boundaries in our culture, but we've had a tendency to be so easily offended that really we have pulled back and the world just said, I'm not interested in that. Uh, for instance, when I was in um, student ministry, when I was a, a teenager, uh, I went to this camp, this church camp, and uh, I was I was. Uh, I wasn't a believer yet. I actually got accepted um, uh, there at that camp. But I remember sitting in a session, and this whole session was about how secular music was wrong, right? And, and the guy went into a whole presentation of, so he took a record player, as if any of us had records. <laughs> right, now they're coming back around. So um, he took a record player, and he put on the Eagles Hotel California. You know what I'm talking about? And he put this on and he said, you know what, teenagers? If you turn this backwards, it says Satan will kill you. (laughs) And so, if you listen to Hotel California, the spirit of the devil will live inside of you. So say no to secular music. And as a teacher, I'm like, 
oh no, right? And so I'm thinking, oh, I'm, this is not going to be good, right? And so he, here's what I would say to that. That's kind of silly, right? Um, a lot of that is really this, um, I, I would say sometimes we're so easily defended that we so pulled back that Paul would probably really identify that as a weakness, that we have, have freedom. And so it's okay to watch Disney films. All right, so easily offended, number one. Second thought, second thought. Immature in knowledge, immature in knowledge. So those who are easily offended, we would, Paul would identify that as a, as, a, as a weak brother and sister, and thinking, being smart about boundaries, obviously, as we engage the culture. And the second thing is um, uh, lacking knowledge. So a new believer, someone who maybe doesn't engage their Bible a lot, doesn't know a lot about um, the spiritual truths or theology or any of these types of things, right? Has it, it's not quite there yet. So this could be a weak brother or sister. Third one he says is experience. Maybe they're lacking experience. And so they would be identified as a, a weak brother or sister. They don't have the experience. Maybe it's on, they've never experienced a mission trip before, so they haven't been cross-culturally to see what the Lord is doing, or they haven't typically been in environments and in settings that, that push on them. And he says, those um, who are strong, those who are strong have an obligation to help the weak. The weight of the passage, the weight of the passage in verse one falls on the strong believer. Falls on the strong believer. He says, those who are strong should help the weak. So we engage one another. We, we welcome one another. We accept one another. And I think sometimes in our zeal for the Lord, We've done a disservice to our young brothers and sisters who are new in the faith. And we're expecting them to be smarter than they are, to, um, to have a different language than they may typically have sometimes, to live differently. And it's really a process of God pushing on them and growing on them and growing them. I have a four and a half year old daughter. Her name is Claire. And we're at that point where we're doing gymnastics and ballet and things I'm not used to. And so I'm, I'm slowly getting there and uh, teaching her about uh, sports, uh, team sports, how to play. She, um, I, I enjoy playing basketball, and so I'll go play basketball, and then I'll come home, and she'll comment on how sweaty I am. But she also asks why I don't have a trophy. And so I always have to explain to her, well, well, baby, daddy's team does always win, but we just don't have trophies for recreational basketball. So... Um, uh, and so imagine this, right? So we, you know, imagine we signed her up for T-ball. She shows up on the field. So you have this 45-year-old uh, coach. He's out there. He gathers the five-year-olds together, and he's talking to me. He says, okay, here's the deal. You got first, second, third base, um, home, home plate, right? So he's having this discussion with five-year-olds, which is pointless. And so he has this discussion. He sends them out into the field. So he goes, you here, you here, you here, you here. No, eight of you can't be in left field. Spread out. And then he walks to the mound. There's a, a five-year-old kid at bat. Walks to the mound, and he hurls one as strong as he can go, probably a good 45 miles per hour. As a dad, so in that moment, there's no T, there's nothing. He just slings it in there. As a dad, right, there's two thoughts. I'm going to think, I kind of like this guy, right? So there's a part of me, you know, with that. But then there's another part of me that's going to be alarmed, and it's going to go, that's, that, this is not going to work. Someone is probably going to get hurt. And I think in the same way, in our zeal for the Lord, as strong believers, and we're strong in various ways, we've expected young believers and new believers to understand the Christian walk and do it well with no room for growth or error. And it's silly, and it's wrong. And so Paul says the strong believer should help the young believer. He, here's the problem, I think, that we see a lot. And we see it in the, the, the bottom part of this. So he says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. And, so he's about to add something to that in verse 1. And not to please ourselves. Here is the default position of humanity. This is our default position, my default position, and your default position. Our default position is seeking our own pleasure. Is it not? Have we not? Has the culture not told us to align our life in such a way that we would seek our own pleasure? 
there, there's a philosophical belief that's out there. It's called hedonism. And the whole belief behind hedonism is that the end game, the end game is pleasure. That's what we shoot for. Whatever makes you happy, whatever brings you pleasure, that is what you go for. It is our default position as sinful, rebellious people. It's what makes this idea of accepting one another so hard because we wanna seek our own pleasure. It's what makes, uh, I, I help organize group life here and um, it, it's what makes group life so difficult because group life is hard. And, and, and many times until you get into it, it doesn't feel like you're seeking your own pleasure, right? It feels like you are taking from your pleasure. And our default position is one that would say, I, I, want, my, I want my own pleasure. Uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, maybe you remember this from, um, from literature class. It's this, uh, this uh, from Mesopotamia, this literature. Uh, there's a character. Her name is Siduri. This is what she says. This is the advice that she gives to Gilgamesh. She's trying to distract him. This is what she says. So true for us today. Fill your belly day and night and make merry. Let the days be full of joy. Dance and make music day and night. These things alone are the concern of men. So she says, fill your belly, dance, make music. These things alone are the concern of men. And I'm fearful that some of us, myself included at times, that instead of helping the weak, instead of welcoming one another, instead of accepting one another, I'm too prone to seek after my own pleasure. And it doesn't, it doesn't honor the Lord. Verse number two, look at verse number two. We'll move a little more quicker. So uh, Romans 15, verse two. He says, let each of us, so he's gonna build on this thought, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up, to build him up. So he says, strong, help the weak. Let's fight this idea of pleasing ourselves. Then let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. True Christian community, true Christian community is about building one another up, about building um, one another up, not taking from one another, he, one, one thing that I've found um, that, that works in opposition to building one another up and accepting one another, this is what we have a tendency to do. This is true of me as well. We have a tendency to ascribe value to people. Like, I think we do it unconsciously. We ascribe value to people. So, for, for instance, uh, think about a scale of one to 10. So you're in a room, maybe you're at work, maybe you're in a social circle that you hang out with, and we ascribe value. We go, that guy's an eight, so let me get close to him because he can help me. He can benefit me. That, that person's a two. Uh, I'll, if I have time, I'll get to him. This person's a six, so maybe, you know, they're kind of connected, kind of not connected, right? Oh, that person, that neighbor is like a negative two. So let's just, let's stay away from him. That's wrong, and it's plain sinful. And it's what we do. It's just, it, there's something wired inside of us to work that way. And if the command is to accept one another, and to bring in one another, if we are thinking these things, consciously or unconsciously thinking these things, we will push away from those who are less than, that we would consider less than, and we would draw near into those who would say are worth more. And so we, we, have, to, we have to fight, um, we have to fight this idea. This is a first century problem. This is what James says. So James chapter two, one through six. And I won't, I won't read it all, I'll just kind of hit it. James chapter two, one through six. He says, my brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man, so imagine this, we're in a setting like this at the church, and this is what he says. For a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. If you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you then not made distinction, uh, distinctions among yourselves and become, listen to what he says, and become judges with evil thoughts? So, so Paul says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good. 
So he's, he's going against, he's building off of verse one and saying, don't seek to please yourself. Seek to please others. But not just seek to please others, but seek to please others for what? For their good. For their good. So how, how, do, we, how do we do this just practically? Um, how, how does this play out? Uh, there, there's that old saying, hear a need, meet a need. Maybe God's called you to be generous towards someone as you can. Say an encouraging word. We talked about this some uh, in the last few weeks about saying an encouraging word uh, to someone. We, we, in, our, in my group two weeks ago, we were talking about this idea of encouraging one another and uh, in, in, in some ways this idea of ascribing value. What would it look like if a, if a community um, w- was affected by a group of believers so much so that we were seeking to encourage those who are in positions ahead of us, at, say at our workplace or, or where, wherever it is, that, that whatever your context is? What if we for the sake of the gospel, said an encouraging word to, to uh, a man or to a woman that, that has the job that we want, could hurt us by encouraging them. But we, we seek to, to build one another up, hear need, meet a need, encur- say an encouraging word, take time to sit down, maybe you just need to sit down with someone, have a face-to-face conversation with somebody, just primarily for the sake of building them up, not to take anything from them, but to seek to build them up, have a cup of coffee, lunch. Uh, it could mean, building one another up for their good could mean that you need to have a, a conversation that could involve confrontation. It's very often, it's amazing to me, I'll have conversations with, um, uh, I work with a lot of college students and a lot of young adults, and uh, I'll have a conversation uh, with them that I know is gonna be a difficult conversation, and, uh, and, and I just, I, I just clearly communicate from my heart in a way that's loving towards them uh, in accordance with the word of God and, uh, and praying over that conversation. So we have that, we have that conversation uh, and, and they walk out of that thing and it's like, we're best friends. I think there's something about um, having honest, think about how countercultural this is, having honest conversations with one another for each other's good, even though it could be difficult and hard. So I've seen this area of your life that I don't feel like it's honoring the Lord or I, I think this is going to be dangerous for you if you continue down this path. I, like we just engage in these conversations for the good of those who are around us. So it's about building one another up. Okay, let's look at verse 3. So moving on. So he says, let each of us please his neighbor in verse 2, verse 3. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you uh, fell, uh, the the reproach of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever is written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Look at verse five. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another. May the God of endurance encourage you to live in harmony with one another. See, here's the thing. Paul clearly says that Jesus is our example here. But I I, I would also say that Jesus is not also our example for accepting others, but he's also our motivation for accepting others. He should be our motivation. So it wasn't enough that Jesus just did it and we were like, okay, great example. Uh, I should live that way. I mean, that's true. We, as we observe Jesus' life, we see him living counterculturally. We see him um, bring in those who are far from God the Father that we would consider cultural outcasts um, that don't have anything, of, seemingly anything of value to the kingdom of God. Jesus is getting close to them. And yes, he does that, but I would also say he's our motivation. See, here's what the Bible says about us pre-Christ. Um, so pre-confessing Christ as Lord. What does the Bible say about us? Well, we, we see in, in the Genesis story, right, we're the apex of creation, so we're the, the, the very best that God's created. Sin enters in, and this is how Paul describes us. So this is Romans chapter five. I would just say, make a note in Romans chapter five. You can start. This is, what, this is what it says about us. This is what it says about us. It's so crucial for us to get this around. So this is five, six. I'm not gonna read it. I'll just identify it. It says that we are weak, that we are powerless and ungodly. Romans 5, 8 says we were sinners. And Romans 5, 10 says we were enemies. 
So we were um, weak, powerless, ungodly sinners and enemies. And in that state, in that state, what does the New Testament tell us? What do the Gospels tell us? That God the Father, in that state, that I'm an enemy of His, I'm a, I'm a sinner, I'm ungodly, I'm powerless. Uh, Ephesians chapter two, one through 10 would say, I'm dead in my trespasses, dead. God the Father welcomed me in, welcomed me into the kingdom of God, that if I would confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that I would believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I'm accepted into the family of God. And so here's a bit of an exercise, right? So Jesus served as our example but he's also our motivation. So think about someone who you, maybe you're not prone to welcome or accept for whatever reason. Line them up with the requirements that, that we just see the New Testament says about us. That we were enemies, that we were dead, that we were sinners, that we were ungodly. Line those things up. If, if God cannot extend an invitation to us through his son and welcome us into the kingdom of God, could we not is it not true that we should be the type of people that are welcoming and accepting to others? Can we not work through our rifts inside of the church? Can we not do these things? And so he served as an example. There's two other things there that we see in the Bible that he talks about. Um, just quickly, I want to mention, because I think they're important. Uh, he says in verse 4, he identifies the word. So he talks about the encouragement of the scriptures, which kind of, I, I get that. We, we see that. We, we understand that. So he talks about the encouragement of the scriptures. And then he uses another word that I'm not so fond of because he's talking about accepting and bringing in one of those. This other word that he says is endurance. He says um, in verse four, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And then he says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. Endurance, that this work is hard, that it's difficult, that the word would serve as a um, encouragement to us. I love what, this is what, what D.A. Carson says. He's a, a theologian in the Christian church and this idea of Jesus serving as our motivation. He says, ideally, ideally the church itself is not made up of natural friends. It is made up of natural enemies. What binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, common football teams, or anything else of that sort. Christians come together. Listen to this. Christians come together because they have all been loved by Jesus himself. They are a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. A band of natural enemies who love each other for Jesus' sake. He is our motivation. If these things were true about us and he brought us in, so it's, it's a valuable exercise as we look at Romans 5 to think, man, that's who I was. Let's finish up here. Looking at, so he says, live in harmony with one another. Look at verse six. This is huge. That together, that together you may with one voice. Look what he's gonna say here. So he says, strong, help the weak. He says, build one another up for your good. Don't go after your own pleasure. He says, uh, endure, <laughs> push through, Right? Uh, there's no other word that I can help like that makes sense for accepting one another other than endure. Let, allow the scriptures to encourage you, ask God to help you, that he would serve as an encouragement to you. It says live um, in harmony with one another. Then in verse six, he says, if we do these things, if we do these things well, he says that together you may with one voice Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, what's it therefore? Anytime you see a word in the Bible, you say, what is it therefore? So he says, because of these things that I just talked about, because of these things I just talked about, therefore welcome one another 
And he's gonna remind us here. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Christ has welcomed you. For, why? For the glory of God. What is the result? The glory of God. Now, what does that mean, the glory of God? Um, I, I, was in a, I was in a coffee shop this week, and it, it kind of helps me to study uh, if I'm just kind of out and about. And so I'm looking at this passage, and, and I'm there, and I've got my headphones in, which in a coffee shop means don't talk to me. So I got him in. I'm just listening uh, to some music, and I'm kind of typing, right, and thinking out my thoughts. And then all of a sudden, I hear over my headphones this, like, beeping noise. It was around 9 30, 10 o'clock on Thursday, and I was like, what in the world? And I noticed everyone um, picks up their phone and starts looking at their phone. And so I'm like, what is going on? So I thought, is there a meteor? Like, is it, is it what, what's happening? Surely I haven't missed, you know, does, did, did God just use, you know, the iPhone for the rapture and I missed it? So, so <laughs> I'm like, I'm a little concerned. And, and, and so I, I, I pick it up and this is what my phone says. September is the National Preparedness Month. Be ready for the next disaster. Did anybody get that text? Yeah, the rest of you, I don't know to tell you. You're, you're not gonna be in good shape. So, so a couple of thoughts here. My first thought was, this is creepy. Anybody else have that? Like they know where you are at all times. I don't even know who they are, but they're there. So, I uh, wanted to smash my phone, but I didn't. So I thought, they know where I am at all times. They know where all of us are at all times. Um, the, the second thought was, if you're prone towards anxiety, you're like, oh, next disaster? Like, it's kind of, you kind of start getting you a little panicky, right? Um, and and here, here's the third thing that I thought. Um, no one woke up that morning. So no one woke up on, on Thursday morning and thought, you know what today is? If I remember correctly, today's the beginning of September. And the beginning of September is National Preparedness Month. Right? No, no one got up and said, honey, this, this, this month is National Preparedness. Maybe you did, right? Maybe, I, maybe I'm speaking to, to free and we should talk later. Um, but no one gathered their family together and said, honey, when you have a conversation, it's, it's September is National Preparedness Month. And so let's go over, you know, fire escape. Uh, let's go over if a meteor is heading to the earth, nothing I can do. If a fire, you know, like no one just got together and started having this conversation. Why was there an awareness of September National Preparedness Month? Why was there awareness of this? The reason there was an awareness of this and the reason everyone picked up their phone was the unity of the message. The unity of the message. It created an awareness of those who are around. So even if you didn't get the message, you're going, what is going on? My, my phone is beeping on silent. It's beeping. So could it be could it be in our desire to see God glorified in our city and around the world, in our workplaces, in our middle schools, in our high schools, in our colleges, wherever we are? Could it be that the world would take notice because of the unity of the message? That the, the world would look at us as a natural, um, as a band of natural enemies. And they would see us and go, man, they have different backgrounds. They have different socioeconomic backgrounds. They have different cultural backgrounds. They're different race. They have, they're just, doesn't seem to have anything in common with one another. Could it be that the unity of the message, the unity of the message could serve as a megaphone to God's goodness and faithfulness to us? And that as we seek to do the hard work of accepting one another and bringing in close to each other, that the gospel would be seen where we live, where we work, where we uh, entertain, where, wherever it is, that we would push back the cultural norm of taking from others and we would push into the gospel reality that we are a people who were far from God that has been welcomed in and brought near 
by the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's the unity of the message. And so maybe this morning, maybe this morning you need to confess. You need to repent to the Lord for having a posture that is unwelcoming to others. Maybe you need to ask for forgiveness. You need to confess to the Lord. Maybe for some of you, you need to begin to do the hard work of getting around people that are different than you, that, that people that don't benefit you. Maybe even in the workplace, you start uh, welcoming uh, uh, someone who maybe doesn't help you or someone who is hard for you that you would just sit down with them and have lunch and, and pull out the lunch together and you just kind of start talking and that would be kind of weird at your work. But maybe you need to do that. Is it because that person is worth it? Kind of. I mean, yeah. I mean, they're creating the image of God. We should be welcoming. No, ab absolutely. But even more than that, even more of a motivation of that is that God would be made much of in our communities, in our city. And the world would look at us as people who are different, as people who are distinct, as people who understand what it means to be welcomed when we were far off. That's how we should, should live. It's the truth. Let me pray for us this morning. God, thank you for your word. God, we, um, we would just pray that you would get the recognition when we accept one another. That you would get the credit when we do the hard work, that when we endure, that you would get the, the glory, you would get the credit, that the unity of the message of accepting one another would garner attention in our city, would garner attention in our workplace, would garner attention in, in our schools. God, that we would have middle schoolers and high schoolers that for the glory of God and the good of those who are around them would be welcoming to one another, would run in opposition to the culture. God, give us courage for this work as it's difficult. God, help us. Thank you that you brought us near through your son. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.